we are in the number four session of 16 sessions during this series. So if you're just now joining us, you will be able to access the recordings on Venerable Yunten's YouTube page. And uh, please enjoy the course. Thank you, Christina. Okay, so um, welcome folks. We'll start with setting our motivation. And so this is something that we'll do each week and is a very common practice in Buddhism, just to kind of clarify for ourselves, why are we studying? What are we studying? What is it all for? So it's on page 91 of uh, the Lama Chippa prayer book. And for those of you on Zoom, I'll do share screen. And so just take a minute and settle yourself into your physicality and just make sure that you're fully in the room that you're in and not too scattered from what came before or what will happen after. And refuge in Bodhicitta. O sangye chudam sogi chunam lai janju padu dani kapsu chi dagi jin sogi pe sonam ki drola penche sangye drupa sho sangye chudam sogi chunam lai janju padu dani kapsu chi dagi jin sogi pe sonam ki Rola penche sangge drupa sho sangge churam sogi churam ha chanchu padu dani kapsu chi dagi jin sogi pe sonam ki rola penche sangge drupa sho. We seek your blessings to complete the perfection of generosity through the guideline teaching for enhancing the mind that gives without attachment, namely transforming our bodies, wealth, and collection of virtues over the three times into the objects desired by each and every sentient being. We seek your blessings to complete the perfection of moral discipline, working for the sake of sentient beings enacting virtuous deeds and not transgressing the bounds of the Pratamoksha, Bodhisattva, and Tantric vows even at the cost of our lives. Should even the myriad beings of the three realms without exception become angry at us, humiliate, criticize, threaten, or even kill us, we seek your blessings to complete the perfection of patience not to be distraught, but to work for their benefit in response to their harm. Even if we must remain for an ocean of eons in the fiery hells of Avicii for the sake of one sentient being alone, we seek your blessings to complete the perfection of joyous effort, to strive with compassion for supreme enlightenment and not to be discouraged. Having abandoned the faults of dullness, agitation, and mental wandering, we seek your blessings to complete the perfection of meditative concentration through the samadhi of single-pointed placement upon the nature of reality, which is that all things are void of true existence. We seek your blessings to complete the perfection of wisdom through the space-like yoga of single-minded placement upon ultimate truth, conjoined with the ecstasy and great bliss induced by the discriminating wisdom analyzing suchness. We seek your blessings to perfect samadhi on illusion by realizing how all external phenomena lack true existence yet still appear, like a mirage, a dream, or the image of the moon on a still lake. Samsara and nirvana lack even an atom of true existence, while cause and effect and dependent arising are unfailing. We seek your blessings to discern the import of Nagarjuna's thought, which is that these two are complementary and not contradictory. And so we just take a minute and think, may we perfect, may we understand, may we embody for the benefit of oneself and others, generosity, ethics, patience, joyous effort, concentration, and wisdom. Okay, 
So just to review, um, generosity from a Tibetan Buddhist perspective is the intention to give. Ethics is restraint from harm. Patience is forbearance with suffering. Joyous effort is enthusiasm for beneficial actions. Concentration is abiding with a beneficial object. And wisdom is a realization of reality, of ultimate reality. So just to kind of keep them clear in our mind, we're up to ethics and we started ethics last week and we're gonna continue on with ethics this week. So just to clarify, we're not just talking ethics in general, we're talking the perfection of ethics. So a paramita, meaning going beyond the end or reaching perfection, this is, we're doing all of these with this bodhicitta motivation. And these practices take us beyond samsara to Buddhahood, where all obscurations have been eliminated and all good qualities have been developed limitlessly. The perfections become super mundane when conjoined with the wisdom realizing the emptiness of inherent existence. So this is going to be the more deep philosophical concept that is going to take longer to get our heads around, but kind of should imbue and qualify all the other five. And the bodhisattva, from that perspective, knows that the agent, the action, the object of each perfection arise dependently, and there are therefore empty of inherent existence. So it's not like these are like good things in and of themselves. It's very contextual, and it's very much about the motivation, but many other things as well. So... When we look at generosity, just to review, we were talking about this intention to give being, and then it can be divided into four categories, lots of different ways it can manifest. There's the obvious one of giving material aid, but there's also giving Dharma, giving refuge, which is like freedom from fear, as well as active love. So when we're looking at generosity, we're remembering the intention is more important than the action. You could do a very sweet thing with a totally performative reason. You know, here I am a grand benefactor. I'm a grand philanthropist. I'm the savior of mankind. Here I will throw money at this problem. That can be useful, but that is not the perfection of generosity. The perfection of generosity is when I can give, I will. Whether that's time or safety or advice or financial resources, if I can, I will. And it's about the open-hearted attitude that's ready to and under the heading of in order to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. I want my mental momentum to go towards developing my potential. And in that way, I'm actually going to benefit sentient beings in the deepest way. So not symptoms relief, but actually getting to the very root of what causes people to struggle in the first place. So we talked about that a fair bit. And then we went into ethics. And from Lama Tsongkhapa, ethical discipline is an attitude of abstention <laughs> that turns your mind away from harming others and from the sources of harm. So it's, it's non-harmfulness in Buddhism. We're not talking about, um, I don't know, restricting yourself. We're not talking about um, being a do-gooder. We're talking about first do no harm like a good doctor. Yeah, and that, that's where we're coming from, from the perspective of ethics. And then everything else is details. What are ways to prevent harm? And you become really personal and specific with yourself. What do I get up to that harms myself or harms others or both? And so this is where we got that conversation about uh, the 10 abstentions or the 10 non-virtues, which were just the classic list of, here's what we normally do that hurts people. Let's get it on our radar so we stop doing it. You know, really straightforward, practical list. And then today we're going to go a bit more into the divisions of ethics. So just to review, these were the 10 non-virtues, right? So not to kill, not to steal, not to engage in sexual misconduct. This is how we harm each other with our bodies. And then we had divisive speech and lying, harsh speech, idle gossip. This is how we hurt each other with our words. 
And then we had idle gossip, or we had covetousness, ill will, and wrong views. And this is how we harm ourselves and then are motivated to harm others with our mind. And when you look at that list that we talked about last time, does there, or is there anything that you wanted to ask about or clarify? You know, is there anything about this list that you object to or want more information on? And go ahead and just uh, spontaneously unmute yourself if so, or um, from the Gampa, you're very welcome to ask anything about this list. It, I mean, it's practical, but is it doable? Is it, yeah, go ahead. Ben, well, I have a question about lying. Yeah. Uh, before when we talked about the five lay vows, uh, we understood that lying was not lying about our spiritual abilities. Um, is that the same case here with lying or is it a different sense of lying? When we're talking about lying, um, what, what Andrea is referring to is if you have the vow not to lie, to break that vow, you have to lie about a spiritual attainment. That's considered like the worst kind of lie. You know, there's a lot of lies and they're not great. But if you were to say, I am an amazing enlightened being and you're not, a cult could form and that would harm people incredibly. And they could listen to your advice and hurt themselves and hurt others under the influence of this charismatic cult leader. So the worst lie is to lie about your spiritual attainments because people will trust you when they shouldn't. You know, it's incredibly damaging. It's damaging for your own practice in a million different ways. So this is like the worst lie, but this is not um, in the list of the 10 non-virtues, it's included. So the list of the 10 non-virtues is about things that are negative karma, whether you have a vow or not, whether you're Buddhist or not, whether you agree or not, these things accumulate negative karma on your mental continuum, regardless if you've promised not to do them. It's just that if you have the vow not to do them, then you have more merit or more positive karma, more, I guess, enriching mental momentum, all of the times that you're refraining from these negativities. So you're really maximizing your mental space in a way. And then when you do you know, go against these, it's of course heavier because you promise not to. Yeah, so vows really um, up the ante karmically, both positive and negative. Yeah. And does that, does that answer your question? Sure. So I think what you're also saying then too, is it does, it does include things where we know that we're not saying the truth about something that could be very simple that has really nothing to do with our spiritual attainments, but maybe just everyday kind of situations. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Honesty is huge in the spiritual path and Self-honesty is huge in the spiritual path, but also just asking ourselves what develops communities, what makes communities feel safe, honesty, transparency, just being real with each other, right? And it, it takes a while to realize all of the half-truths or kind of quiet deceptions or benign seeming white lies that we do just kind of out of societal habit. You know, the things that are socially acceptable, but are actually not particularly good for your practice or good for your relationships long term. It takes a while to kind of get to the subtleties because we might not be, you know, big liars all the time, or we might only exaggerate at a party with a few drinks in us or something. And, you know, it's not like a huge problem in our life, but it's still something that kind of eats away at the path. And the result of lying is that people don't trust you. Now they might not trust you in the immediate because you're a bad liar, right? But what if you're a good liar that people do believe? It means they won't trust you in future lives. You're creating the cause to not be trusted in future lives. So even if you're a brilliant liar that gets away with it, um, the piper's gotta be paid, right? Yeah, yeah. so uh, other thoughts about those 10 non-virtues? They're important to get clear. I know intellectually they're very straightforward, but just in terms of your life um it's nice and oh. no go for it yeah um yeah go ahead tenzin and then um we'll do a gompa question um yeah, i was thinking uh in terms of divisive speech i, I think i saw divisive speech and idle gossip mm -hmm. uh what, what should i be what should i thinking be on you know how sometimes you know we rant you know yeah 
yeah, after work, like, you know, get outside and then, you know, you, you meet our, your friends and they're like, oh man, what a day, huh? And then you start talking and then, you know, sometimes knowingly, sometimes unknowingly, you know, you end up just ranting and um, I, I find myself, you know, sometimes noticing that some of the stuff that I'm saying is pretty divisive, even though it might be an expression of what I'm going through, but it's still divisive. Yeah, yeah, it's the truth, but not helpful. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it's like, how do you, like, do you say the truth because it's the truth, or do you refrain from truth because it's, you know, it would seem so because it's a non-virtue. Well, it seems like you're asking, um, like, you have to be talking. You could just not talk, <laughs> right? You know, and then problem solved. No, I'm just teasing. Um, it's, it's that, you know, lying is heavy and is difficult, but in terms of divisiveness, divisive speech can be true, right? You can say, I know this about someone, I'm going to tell you because I want you to not like them. You know, like it sounds very, you know, playground, but we still as adults do this constantly. Guess what so-and-so said, guess what they did. And it could be quite true. That is what they said and did, but why are you saying it? You know, are you saying it to problem solve? Are you saying it to figure out a way to communicate with them better and you need to bounce ideas off? Are you saying it because you're worked up and need to kind of like move through your emotion and settle so that you can do your own problem solving? Or are you just whining, <laughs> you know? And that's the question is why? Yeah, so if you're doing something that has the potential to be divisive, the main thing is why are you saying it? And if you're saying it with this like, you're saying to yourself, oh, I'm just venting, but in the back of your mind, you know, and I kind of want you to not like them too. <laughs> mm. You know, whether it's a political figure or an authority figure or your friends or whoever in your life, if the background idea is, I don't want you to like them either, be on my side, definitely divisive speech, definitely. Or if I want you to like this camp and not that camp, divisive speech. But it's sort of, yeah, go ahead. Um, so, so, so I guess, um, so we should pay attention to where the source is, whether it's, if it's coming from a place of, oh, it's just how it is right now, you know, in terms of divisive speech. Um, so just to, to look deeper and find the source of where, uh, this need to rant is coming from. <laughs> listening or saying? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, do, were you saying about listening or about talking? Oh, talking. It, it, talking, yeah, no, I'm with you. It, look, it's, it's, it becomes a little bit more subtle when you get into the nitty gritty, because what if it's something like a political belief that you think is damaging to hold, and you do in fact wanna say that is a damaging view, and if people were educated, then they would have this better view, and I want you to turn to this view because it's healthier and better for society or whatever. You know, Is that divisive speech or not? And it really is very much about your motivation. And also, what are you really doing? Are you trying to get people on board because your view is healthier and better for society? Or is it kind of a performative, I'm the smarter one and the better one and they're the stupid people and we should exclude them from society if they don't get on board? Because that's not helpful, right? So it's again, it keeps coming back to why. For you, why? What is your intention? And the main place karma is created is the mental factor of intention. Yeah, so if you have a positive intention, even if you have a, a failure in not dividing people, you're trying to bring them together and they still divide. If your intention is to harmonize, it's still positive karma, even if you were a terrible failure at it. Yeah, <laughs> and you know, if your intention is to divide people, but you're not successful and they stay happily harmonious together anyway, you failed at your divisiveness, still you accumulate negative karma of divisive speech because you wanted to divide them, right? So it's very much about your intention, very much about your intention. Yeah, um, we're gonna have a Gomba question. I think I don't understand the number eight on the list. Can you say the microphone? Could you? Number eight. Number eight. The covetousness? Yeah. Covetousness. Sure. So covetousness from a Buddhist perspective is very much related to attachment, which basically means exaggerating. So what are you exaggerating? 
you're looking at something that has maybe good qualities or maybe has the conditions for some happiness. There is something good about it. And that what you're doing is you're exaggerating how good or how happy it's gonna make you, whether it's a person or a situation or an object, right? And so you take an example like, I don't know, the next time, the last time you bought a new computer, okay? Before you bought the new computer, you might've done research and planning and what's the best one. And there was, it was stress and anxiety, is this the best one? And then you found the best one and you're very excited. And it's like, this one's gonna be great. This is gonna solve all of my technology problems, whatever and you're anticipating and you're planning and then you buy it and it's shiny and it's new and it's, oh, this is great. And then you open it and you're like, where is everything? Ah, they moved where the things are. I have to find where the things are now. Oh, I have to learn this new operating system. Oh, whatever, right? And then there's the like, the honeymoon's over, right? The honeymoon is over with your new computer relationship and reality sets in. It's not to say it's not a good computer. It's that, you know, the shine wore off. And what happens with attachment is that you're inevitably disappointed. Why? Because it was never true. There was a portion that was true, but the whole story of your attachment was not true. So with covetousness, your mind is craving something, wanting something that someone else has or is existing outside of your life. You really want it because you think this will make your life better. Yeah, you're really giving all the power to the object or the person or the situation. You really think this is going to save my life. And then when, or get, make my life more fun or make my life more entertaining or whatever it is, because it does have some ability to do that contextually. Yeah. And then your hunger arises. And the difference between just a good plan for something that will help your life and covetousness is how agitated your mind is and how certain of the goodness of the thing you are. Because there is nothing really in samsara that has the power attachment gives it. You know, it's, um, you can see it in relationships very easily, like a new friendship or a new romance where people are a little too excited about each other. You know, they're like, oh, even their smell, even their bad breath in the morning. Oh, it's just, everything is wonderful. You know, like their pimples are great. Like you can get really carried away, you know, in new fresh friendships or fresh romances. And then once the shine wears off, if it was really love, you stay together, right? you know, you stay as friends or you stay as lovers or you stay as, you know, spouses or whatever. But if it wasn't love, if it was just attachment, when reality dawns, you're mad at them. It's not just that you lose interest. You can get mad at them like you betrayed me. Attachment betrayed you. Yeah. Attachment exaggerated. It picked out a few qualities that you liked and said, that's the whole story. Those qualities were there, but there were a million other qualities as well. And attachment kind of chose not to see them. And then when you does see them, you're mad, like you were sold a false bill of goods. Yeah. So covetousness, the classic. But isn't that how our whole society is set up? Indeed, that's the problem. <laughs> as a child on, that is what we are doing. Yeah, she, she's saying, isn't that what uh, what we as a society do? Isn't that what society's built on? And I would say, yes, that's the problem. problem. Yeah, exactly. Yes, exactly. Hence why it's on the list of don't do that. <laughs> All right? It should be on top. Huh? It should be on top. <laughs> should be on top. <laughs> right. <laughs> gotcha. Yes. <laughs> yes. Perhaps. And, you know, it's more in terms of coarse and subtle, not worse and better. <laughs> So coarse is the physical thing, slightly more subtle is verbal, more subtle is mental. <laughs> so I agree. Yeah, in a way, it's really the everyday problem we smack right up against every single day. Almost all of our conflicts are based on disappointed attachment. It starts with the yeah, it starts with the sweater. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the sweater is going to save my life. It's going to make my life so much better, soft and comfy and just the right style. And then it shrinks and it's failed you. Someone doesn't like it and you're bad, et cetera. Exactly, exactly. So these 10 non-virtues, this is our life. This is our everyday life. So if we're really looking at, these are setting ourselves up to be even less happy than we already are. Yeah, these are our plans that are doomed to failure. But we do all of these non-virtues because in the moment, 
they feel like they're either protecting us or supporting us or bringing us something. And they might in the immediate, but not in the long term. So they're short term solutions that always have a backlash. Yeah, the cycle always comes back and bites you, sometimes within the same day. <laughs> yeah, but certainly eventually. So it's why we want to notice them and bring them to the forefront of our mind as things to stop because they hurt us, they hurt others. Yeah. I have another question yeah, of um, the 10th one. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about wrong view and uh, I, I haven't been like, I didn't um, hear about Buddhism for a long time in my life. So mm -hmm. uh, is it um, about wrong view on the, um, knowing Buddhism or Dharma in every kind of uh, philosophy or way of thinking of uh, human being, of us as human being. Because if we have wrong view, we, we did nothing to have those wrong view. It's right. only human, you know? Yeah, this no, that's not wrong view. No, don't worry. <laughs> I don't worry. Uh, wrong view is not confusion. Wrong view is thinking wrongly. And the worst one is thinking wrongly about cause and effect. So if you think negative destructive behaviors lead to happiness and you act from that place, or you think that positive beneficial actions lead to suffering and so you avoid them, that is a wrong view. And we think, oh, well, we would never do that. But, you know, it's kind of, it's like, coarse superstitions that are not just kind of confusions, but you really believe them. Yeah, really incorrect beliefs. And for us, you know, cause and effect is a huge premise in Buddhism to realize that even if it's a long term effect that happens, if you do something destructive, that leads to suffering. It's obvious saying it out loud. But it's not obvious in the way that we behave in our daily life. In our daily life, we're acting as if we don't realize that. And that's not necessarily a wrong view, but it is if we believe that the negative thing we're doing is going to achieve happiness. So can you think of an example of a wrong view that just regular folks might have, or they give too much power to a belief that deserves a little bit more investigation? You know, there might be something like, I don't know, something like astrology, which might have elements that are useful to consider, but then people give it too much power and say, I have to be this way because I'm a Scorpio. <laughs> like they have no choice, right? It, like against their will. They're like, well, look, I, I'm, a, I'm obsessed with sex and death because I'm a Scorpio. It's not my fault. I hold no accountability. You know, people that go too far with it, right? And like, yeah, so it's not to say that because of our karmic connection with planets that there might be energetic influences that can be maybe read and interpreted in a million different ways. Maybe that can be true. But a wrong view would be to think, I am trapped by the fate of my birth date, <laughs> right? That would be going too far. Do you feel the difference? Yeah, or definitely if I walked under that ladder, I'm gonna have bad luck. That's definitely why. They seem foolish until you look at your own ones. And, and some pop psychology has whiffs of wrong views in it. Yeah, I'm not talking about valid psychology, but like pop psychology or pseudoscience. Those are the versions of wrong views that we see in modern day life. And people can really believe in these things and leads to a lot of harm and a lot of confusion. Yeah, so they're, they're quite negative for you, but they can be negative for others as well because they you know, get on board with it. So you're not lying because you believe it, <laughs> that it's having a similar effect of leading people astray. So there's a lot of examples of that. Yeah, yeah, any other thoughts? Yeah, Paige, go ahead. Hi, thank you so much for um, having this session. It's interesting that you talk about all these uh, different uh, actions that you have to avoid. Um, it, for, for some people who work in the science sciences, it's, it's like I do, it's automatic that we avoid lying and we avoid, we follow ethical procedures. We have to prepare ethics applications for all of our studies anyway. Mm. But it, it only goes so far, right? It only goes to the very superficial um, level of ethics. And what you're talking about goes even deeper. It's actually going 
inside of yourself and saying, are you committing these actions inside of your mind before you even speak to them, before you even um, act them out in some way? So I'm wondering, you know, it, it sounds like we, what we have to do is constantly monitor our minds every second of the day. And, world, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and habitually our minds tend to turn to negative thoughts because we're like, oh, I'm no good because I did this. Oh, I made that mistake. This is one of my problems is I keep on telling myself I made the mistake of doing something, something. Is that considered negative thinking? Certainly it's, it's like this fine line between what is mindfulness and accountability and taking responsibility, good. Mm -hmm. What is mindfulness that then turns into self-consciousness, self-shame, over-identification, that is not useful or true. You know, it's like we've made a million mistakes for a million reasons. We're responsible. We need to purify or we need to address them. But we should never think of them as us because they aren't us. Every mm -hmm. single choice you ever made was a coming together of countless conditions. One of the conditions was you doing it, but many things influenced you doing it. Mm -hmm. So you have the responsibility, but not the fault. And this is such an important distinction because then you don't feel like you're bad and need to be made unbad or you're broken and need to be fixed because that is not the case. Your mental continuum always has pure potential to develop. And that's where we should place kind of identification if anywhere and eventually no identification, but it makes way more sense to connect with your potentiality than the mistakes made under the influence of ignorance because it's just ignorance, right? It's not badness, you were confused. It made sense at the time. You know, it was a knee jerk, spontaneous thing. It was, I don't know, fed by your family of origin issues, millions of reasons. It was too hot that day, whatever. So you're like, yep, that was a mistake, but I am not bad. Yes, that was a mistake I should repair in some way, but I am not bad. And that's, that's where we wanna land. So if you're starting to go into self-shame or self-doubt or really looking down on yourself because of noticing your mistakes, it's going the wrong way. Mm -hmm. It should be much more like you've identified a disease. You didn't know why you were sick. You felt sick. You were feeling unwell. And then the doctor said, it's this. There's a relief in that. You know, even though you're still sick, you're like, oh, good. That's why. Oh, God, I was freaking out. Okay, that's what it is. And then we look at the strategies around managing that. So much of the problem is not knowing what the thing is. So these 10 non virtues are like a way of understanding why we're sick. And you go, oh, I have a shorter lifespan or I have illness because of old killing karma. I have a lack of resources or a lack of access to supports because of old stealing karma. I have difficulties in my marriages or my friendships because of old sexual misconduct karma. You know, they're all related. Things are of a similar type. And so then you're like, oh, that's why. Okay, going forward, I'm going to actively save life or at least not kill. Going forward, I'm gonna actively be generous or at least not steal. You know, going forward, I'm gonna honor my promises yeah, and I'm going to make sure that I don't encourage things that are related to betrayal. You know, it just becomes strategic then rather than good person, bad person, because that's too simplistic and it's not true anyway. Mm. You know, thank you. Yeah, definitely. It's a good question. Very good. Um, Christina? Muted. Mm -hmm. Muted, muted, you're muted. <laughs> I said, I'm just curious. And I thought you said me too, but you said muted. <laughs> I mean, I am now. <laughs> um, I, I'm just curious, For in my own experience, um, I, I have a, a lot of, uh, like this question came up off of what um, Paige just brought up. I sometimes, I, I definitely have a kind of a, I'll put myself down in, in a lot of ways, but then it, mental, it's all in my mind. But then, when I, when I actually get to celebrate, like I've done something well, like, oh, wow, somebody gave me the advice to be more compassionate in a, in a tough situation. And, and it's actually shifted my, my way of being with this person. And I feel really good. Like, 
oh, I'm, I'm doing great. And, and then I, I like immediately, I'm like, oh, whoa, don't get ahead of yourself. Like, and I just like demolish all of that. Um, it often happens also when sometimes I'm hearing teachings. It had, it, this isn't, didn't, this didn't used to happen. It's like a lately thing. And I'm just like, whoa, why are you getting so ahead of yourself? Like you're, and so I get really concerned, like, oh yeah, I understand that. And like, not that I have it, like, <laughs> like, oh yeah, I got that. I'm, I am that, not that like that, but it, it concerns me that I'm, I get this like big hearted thing, like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm getting it. Or, and then, and then I'm like, oh no, you can't think that that's, you're, you're, you're going to start thinking you have it and you really don't. And you're, you know, that you understand what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. You're like, you're worried that it's pride or something, you know, you're worried yes. by yeah, acknowledging like, the good that then you're going too far also the other way. Right. Right. But so then I'm you also are it. killing the joy a little bit, you know, by like kind of right, saying, no, exactly. no, don't you're so good. Then you kill the joy and you squash the momentum. You know, I was like, yeah, oh, <laughs> this that's the technical <laughs> term right isn't it right yeah. <laughs> but you know it's, I, I think that there's a similar adage where you're really saying all good things are done interdependently just like all bad things were done interdependently so you can think it is so wonderful that that happened meaning that that I was compassionate that day when normally I would have been impatient you think that is wonderful that is worth celebrating, but you're not thinking, and I am amazing, <laughs> you know, you're allowed to be happy. In fact, you should be happy that good was done. It helps the momentum. Yeah, it helps you want to do more of it. And, and I think that that should be kept and increased and rejoicing is a practice. It's a real practice in Buddhism and it's a cheesy word and it's cringy and it, depending on how you were brought up, it can really kind of make you go, oh, yuck, I don't like that rejoicing. I'm so good. No, it's not. I'm so good. It's that that was so good that it happened. I'm so glad that it happened. I'm so glad I was a part of that happening but I don't have to identify with it or think that I'm amazing because of it. That's the going too far. And you're not doing that, but you're going too much into, but I can't be happy about it. No, you should be happy about it. Be happy. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And any moment in time that we're going against our old habits of self-cherishing and self-grasping and kind of having this very normal worldly view of me first, me first, anytime we're thinking, others exist <laughs> is like worth a party. It's like worth a celebration because it's so against how we were brought up, how we've been conditioned, what advertising feeds us. So we should really be rejoicing a lot. Yeah. Any moment that you're like, oh, I was going to do the wrong thing. And for once I chose not to, let's like, yeah, throw a parade. <laughs> you know, it's amazing. But yeah, in both cases, don't identify with it just identify it yeah 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 any other thoughts thanks yeah good questions guys um other thoughts about the 10 non-virtues or um ideas coming up i'm thinking about getting you water that's what oh <laughs> <laughs> thank you it's okay at the break okay yeah yeah so they're cl they're clear enough any ones to clarify before we shift And, uh, you know, the, the one that people get stuck on a little bit, um, what is harsh speech? Um, harsh speech is wanting to wound with your words. So it's not like it's swearing or being rough or being kind of like coarsely spoken. It's what are you wanting to do with your words? Are you wanting to wound or are you wanting to make people uncomfortable? Are you wanting to do something unsettling? So that's harsh speech and then idle gossip. It's not like it's the worst one, but it becomes one of the worst ones because of how often. So it's like the least on the list, but it's the most common on the list. And so because of repetition, it becomes one of the most problematic. So this idle gossip is basically senseless speech or filling in space with no purpose. It's usually driven from some anxiety or some attachment or just kind of like fear of space. And it's very understandable and natural but it's not about the topic, it's about the reason. So you could be talking about the weather with someone because that puts them at ease. It's a safe topic. And then in no way is that senseless speech. Or you could be talking about the weather to fill in the space because you're freaking out about silence. <laughs> yeah, or you're wanting to just hear your, the sound of your voice, that's negative, yeah. So it's not the topic, it's the reason. 
Yeah, Janine. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm wondering, kind of related to that is just activities that seem kind of like filling space, like watching TV or just hanging out, you know, can you speak to that a bit? Well, it's again, the reason why. Yeah, so the reason why, you know, is it uh, covetousness, ill will or wrong views? You know, the, it, it's all variations of that or is it genuinely, you need to rest in order to continue to do positive work and rest fuels joyous effort. You have to rest. It's, and it's not like Yuntan being modern and saying rest is important. No, it's in the Lam Rim, you know, rest if you're feeling tired, it says it in black and white. In the joyous effort section, it says, if you get tired, rest, <laughs> right? So obvious, so straightforward. But I think sometimes we only give ourselves permission to rest after we're burnt out. Like now I've paid the price that I need to pay in order to be allowed to stop. And that is not actually effective for momentum and continuity. You have to stop before you're exhausted. Yeah, before you've gone to the very ends of your limits. And if watching TV is restful, then do it. If watching TV is not restful and it stimulates you and it's one more thing to process, that's something to look at as well. So it's, it's again, it's the reason, not the activity. Yeah, if watching TV is the only time you get your kids to sit still and hang out with you, and in, you know, boring moments of the show, you can say, so how's school? And that's the only way they will allow that conversation. I mean, that's positive, isn't it? Yeah, you're being skillful. You're meeting them where they are. Yeah. So again, it's, it's the reason why. And the tricky thing here is it's so easy to lie to yourself and say, I'm doing this because of rest so I can continue my virtuous work when really you're just like, I want to zonk out and just binge and feed the attachment beast. And that's actually why. So only you know, you know, only you know the reasons why. And when you make it, these choices from the wrong place, keep a sense of humor about it. Like, of course you do. You don't have other strategies in place yet. So like good old fashioned addiction psychology, you don't wanna just suddenly rip out something without having community support. Similarly, if we're trying to stop doing some of these 10 non-virtues without filling first something positive, it's very easy to trigger like a deprivation mentality. You know, if you're used to, I don't know, taking up more than your fair share of space, or you're used to going somewhere in your mind that is non-virtuous, but somewhat soothing, some kind of covetousness attachment fantasy is some way of self-soothing. And you just say, no, don't do that. I can't shut it down, but you're not feeding it with something virtuous and positive and like that, then you can kind of get into a bit of a panic. So, so ask yourself, what am I gonna replace this with? Not what am I gonna like slap my own wrist and say, I'm not allowed to do, that's not skillful. Yeah, it's what am I gonna replace this with that's better, that's healthier. Yeah, cause then it becomes more sustainable as well. Thank you, yeah, that's good. Okay, so, so more on ethics, um, there's these kind of three aspects which are very straightforward. Basically ethics boils down to either refraining from negative destructive actions or performing positive beneficial actions or working for the welfare of others. This is when it's a perfection. This is when ethics is part of your work to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. So, you know, ethics in general is refraining from harm. But if we're doing this perfection of ethics, there's also a proactive aspect to it. And I think that's useful to kind of sit with and unpack a bit. So this is from Geshe Rabtin's commentary. Um, he says, the first aspect is the protection of our body, speech, and mind from performing unskillful deeds. We have the tendency to act unskillfully and this tendency needs to be controlled. We protect ourselves from acting this way when we stop using our body, speech, and mind in harmful ways. If we let our body, speech, and mind go as they will, we will experience much suffering in the future. This protection of body, speech, and mind is the first aspect of morality or ethics. So it's, it's very straightforward in terms of intelligence is just how do you really look at what are the like tendencies or the habits of body, speech, and mind that really need a bit of 
mental airtime to unpack just in an ordinary day. What are the things you get up to that are not as healthy as they could be, particularly the mental habits, because the verbal and the physical stem from there. But if it helps you, you can look at the verbal and the physical first as a way of understanding which afflictions are your main issues. You know, so if your main issue is, I don't know, divisive speech, ask, is that divisive speech coming from that's my common way of connecting with people and I have an attachment around, you know, an exaggerated attachment around this is how people will like me is if I'm kind of sassy and sarcastic about political figures I don't like or about coworkers who are problematic. Is that my way of bonding? Is that why I do divisive speech? Do I do divisive speech because I'm angry and I'm full of rage and impatience and irritability and that's a way to vent my spleen? Do I do it because I don't know what else to talk about? You know, like the reason why. So whether you start with what's my mental negative habit or you kind of put a pin in that and say, I'm not sure actually, what are my physical and verbal behaviors that are negative? And you kind of find which one seems to be your go-to and then you ask why and do the deep dive. Because then again, you, you've found the disease and now you can apply the remedy. Um, yeah, go ahead, Teresa. Yeah, Mike coming over. So for a long time for me, it's when I'm tired. So particularly, I don't sleep well. So I wake up in the middle of the night and I've learned like, don't take my thoughts seriously, but I cannot stop the negative mm. thoughts. I don't know if you have any suggestions about that when I'm tired. Yeah, when you're tired is when they come out. Is it negative thoughts that are of what color, <laughs> what variety of negative thoughts? It's usually like the world is ending. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, the world is ending. And yep, that is no good. And I'm sad or I'm mad or I'm uh, disassociated. I think mad. Yeah, mad. I think anger. Yeah. yeah. And you're mad at. Not at myself. It's usually at something out there mm. is ruining my life. Yep. And then I wake up in the morning and it's all fine. <laughs> right. But in the middle of the night, yeah. it's like this recurring. That, yeah, no, I think that's a relatable. <laughs> that's very relatable. Yes. Yeah. Anybody else <laughs> wake up in the middle of the night and be like, ah, the planet's burning. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, darn those corporations or whatever. You know, I think that it's uh, it's useful to kind of like, Take the content and then take a step away from the content as if you're the scientist of your own experience. Yeah, if you were not the person experiencing it, if it was like your best friend was telling you about this. And with that space, you can ask, what is the deepest fear? Or what is the biggest worry? Yeah, and you're like, well, the worry is that the planet's gonna blow up. Okay, but why would that be bad? Now it's obvious why that would be bad, but why would that be bad for you cosmically in your path? Is there a fear of annihilation or a fear of loss of existence? Is there a doubt about the presence of future lives? Is there a doubt about your own ability to cope with worse circumstances? Is it, you know, and so you kind of like keep going, keep going like, okay, the fear is the planet blowing up, but like, why do you assume that's a bad thing? Like it is a bad thing, but why? And kind of go, you know, are you, are there, beautiful things that you're going to miss out on seeing and there's kind of some kind of longing and poignancy about I always wanted to see this place and now it's destroyed or you know and you're just kind of like checking around for how come it's bad it seems self-evident but why for me why for me is that bad news right and as you keep doing the deep dive you might come down to some really primal stuff that drives the rest of your day with without you realizing it you know, and all of your basic human interactions in a day might also have that same affliction together with them. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's useful to do the deep dive, I think. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, common and understandable, but yeah, I keep asking, why is that bad though? <laughs> and you think it's obvious why it's bad. No, but why for me mm -hmm. is that bad though? You know, because I, I sometimes think about that. It's very poignant that the so many things are changing in the climate and all of the reasons for that and all of the people's ideas around that. But why, why am I distressed? But also when am I distressed? Because there's probably out many hours, many days and weeks where it doesn't even cross your mind. 
So when is it distressing and why does that trigger happen? You know, what are the other things making you look at it and get worked up? It's, it's interesting. Yeah? And um, that's a, another good question to bring to your practice is why this? Why now? I do this a lot with um, people who are hard work. If, if it's someone that normally they have something a little bit abrasive in their personality habits, but normally I don't mind, you know, I can roll with it. I'm used to it. But then one day, like it gets to me and I feel grumpy. I ask, why this? Why now? Because they've been like that the whole time. Why is it annoying me today? <laughs> it's not like a new behavior. Why this? Or there's a million things that people do that are obnoxious. Why does this one obnoxious thing get to me when all of these other bad behaviors don't worry me? Why this? Why now? You just keep doing the deep dive. Yeah, Paige? Oh, I just wanted to add a little bit more to that. And the way I get around the, the, the fear of the world kind of going up in flames is to realize very, very deeply the earth is incredibly resilient, okay? There is so much life on this planet. It is spilling with life. So you can look in the most extreme environments, deep in the ocean, in the middle of nowhere, there's the vents blowing a lot of volcanic material, and you still have bacteria growing there. So you still have animals growing around those vents. You can go into caverns that are very deep in the, in the ocean. There's no light, there's no sunlight at all. Um, it's very deep, the water's very cold. There's animals living there. Yeah, yeah, and tardigrades, right? So <laughs> you really need to see the earth as the most abundant place of life. And you, you really need to see that this is, this is temporary. This global warming is temporary. Um, the earth will rebound, it will recover. So that's one of the ways that I kind of get around it. I also like to think of it as being everyone is working together to try to stop this from happening. So there are millions of scientists, millions of people around the world that are trying really hard to reverse the damage. So I like to think that way. And then it helps me because I've had that same fear as well. It's like, what's going on? Why are we doing this? This is terrible. Yeah, and it's a, it's a good point because, you know, my, my own technique is to go to the worst case scenario and make peace with it. This, what Paige is saying is also look at the transformative aspect and the positive aspect and the long view and the big picture of the way in which things get better or different or transform into something else. And it's uplifting and it's inspiring and it can soothe you you know, life continues, but like whatever the, the subject is, it's kind of like we're talking about two techniques that both work. Does it make, and for you as an individual or you on that day, does it make more sense to go to the absolute worst case scenario? What's the worst that could happen and unpack why that worries you and how to make peace with it? Or does it make sense to go to the extreme of the changes and the transformations and the progress that can happen and the possibilities? And I think it really depends on the day and it really depends on the person, what's gonna be the thing that brings insight as well as what brings soothing. Yeah, yeah, either. So yeah, so it's a good, it's a good addition. So there's a couple more and then we'll take a little stretch break and do the meditation. Um, so the second one is to protect others in the same way that we protect ourselves. For instance, it, when someone is about to kill an animal, we demonstrate that it's wrong to do so. We're protecting that person from committing harmful actions. So, you know, this is something that must be done skillfully so that people don't feel patronized. You know, they don't feel condescended to, they don't feel managed, they don't feel dominated, you know, all these things. But to really ask ourselves, what is the ethics of benefiting others really mean? How do we actually benefit others? we stop them from hurting themselves. One, yeah, we stop them from hurting themselves. What's the thing that hurts them? Their own negative karma ripening. So let's help them not create negative karma. And this is so delicate because we don't want to be like a goody two shoes. You know, we don't want to be um, moralistic. We don't want to be all kind of like religious, <laughs> right? We just want to be a good example. And kind of be a safe split, safe space to not have cynicism, you know, to not be jaded, to not kind of go to the dark side. And to do that from a place of real wisdom and common sense, 
that is able to do productive, beneficial actions without it being a big deal. Yeah, so you're like, just as part of your life, when you notice your speech going divisive, you catch yourself, you might even name it and say, oh, that's getting a bit critical. All right, let's just stop for a second. What I'm really worried about is that this or this, and then you shift gears and you're modeling in the conversation that you can acknowledge that you make mistakes with your speech and then make adjustments and then move on. And it's just normal and ordinary and in the flow with no guilt or shame. You're just noticing yourself, adjusting when you need to. And then when other people are with you, they know it's safe to correct themselves. You know, they, you know that if they um, flub and do a little lie or a little exaggeration, they can go, oh, wait, wait, wait. No, actually, that's not quite true. No, what's true is this. Yep, actually this, sorry, sorry. I was going the wrong way for a sec. And you can, they can shift gears because they know it's safe to. You know, they know that you're not gonna come down on them like a ton of bricks for saying the wrong thing. You know, for example, so what are the ways to have the ethics of benefiting others? We wanna stop them from hurting themselves. We wanna stop them from hurting themselves by preventing them from creating negative karma. We can't always just stop people. What's the best way to actually help them? It has to be really in the flow with who you already are and the relationships you already have. You don't want to suddenly start becoming like a spiritual person, you know, or like a religious person, because that is so obnoxious. Yes. It's icky to be around someone who's so perfect or trying to be so perfect or like, you know, you can't like let your gut out and let your hair down and just like sit like a regular person, you know, you have to sit up straight with a religious spiritual person. Yeah. Don't cough. Don't burp. It gets a little bit uptight. Yeah. And so we have to kind of model that it's safe to make mistakes. It's like a paradox, because if you model that it's safe to make mistakes, it's easier for people to not make mistakes or make smaller ones because they can adjust it when it's little. Do you know what I mean? And, and that's, I think that's part of the culture that we wanna create too, is that when people do the wrong thing, we want it to be safe enough for them to say, whoops, I did the wrong thing and to still be included in society and for repairs and healing to be able to happen. If when someone does the wrong thing, the conclusion is now you are exiled <laughs> from society or a family or a group, why would anyone ever admit to anything? Why would they? If the conclusion is, well, then you will be asked to leave. So we have to make it safe enough to like fall on your face. And the only way to do that is to kind of fall on your face and be like, look, I'm okay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> however that looks, right? So it takes a lot of bravery to be a fool, but we all are fools. It's more just owning it, yeah? So this one way, okay? So how do we create the cause or create this atmosphere where people are not being unethical? If you're a parent, it's a bit more straightforward. You know, you're explaining about the importance of ethics and why they're important by your behavior is shown and all these things very straightforward friends and family it's got to be delicate because you don't want to be dominating or trying to change people or be an uppity you know but if the conversations go in a bad way you can gently help it turn a corner without you know planting a big sign that says that is a bad topic we shall not talk about now we will talk about good topics only you know in this kind of like obnoxious way you just gently change the topic just gently move it to another place you're saving them you're saving you and it's just quiet and in the flow but it means that you have to kind of prepare yourself when you know that you're going to be around people whose influence on you is strong because you want to be a positive influence on them you don't want them to be a negative influence on you. Yeah, and if they're a very strong negative influence on you, you might need a bit more space while you gather your strength. Yeah, and it's not thinking that they're bad, it's just acknowledging their negative habits are very strong and ingrained, and it's easy for them to kind of pull you off track because you have those tendencies too. So none of this is with judgment, none of this is with kind of looking down on folks. It's just acknowledging some habits are easier to work with than others. And we're all at different levels because of countless causes and conditions, yeah. So that's one to sit with. And then the last one is this working for the welfare of sentient beings. So when we perform any skillful deed, 
This automatically protects us from performing any unskillful one. You know, it's so logical, right? It's like, uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> so, but really, if you're doing something positive, there's no space for the negative. So you're proactively working for the welfare of sentient beings. So this substitution of skillful action in the place of unskillful action is this third aspect of the perfection of morality. And so when we're looking at these three, it's just like mental projects, mental projects that come into physical behaviors and verbal behaviors. Why do we do it? We don't want to hurt ourselves. We don't want to hurt others, but also we want a better, healthier society. Not because this is a should or a shouldn't list, not that this is an identity. Yeah, it's about we want a healthier, more productive society and we can be an aspect of that happening. You know, so just kind of take all of the identification business out of it and just kind of let it inspire you that it's good to have a framework to live by. So, so any thoughts there before we take a little stretch and then do our meditation? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we'll bring the we'll bring the mic over just so the zoomers can hear you. Um, so, are there ideas that um, anyone can give when? Because I'm I'm 58, so my behaviors are very ingrained. And this is all new to me. So I leave here, and oh my gosh, I'm gonna be so I'm not gonna. You know, I'm not going to have a big mouth, and I'm not <laughs> going to be this, and and then, you know. Yeah, yeah, then the habits creep in. Yeah. Path kind of starts, and then I'll, yeah. And, so, and then by, you know, the time, you know, today came again, I'm like, oh my gosh, I really need to get back there, because it, it just. Yeah, we're hardwired, like yeah. All of this seems like, um almost like a no-brainer yeah but but yeah to live it is so i mean it, it's just changing your core yeah yeah and 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 making your core a different core to make you a more beautiful person yeah um and healthier for yourself and and everyone around you absolutely but, so when we're because I'm very spontaneous, and so I bet, and <laughs> yeah. then I'm like, oh, no, 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 I should have said that, but then, you know, I'm yeah, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do, I, I know, I know what you mean, and I think that when, whenever we see something as spontaneous, what it really means is it's a very, very strong habit, so it comes out naturally, you know, quote, naturally, but it's only natural because of habit. You know, and so that's actually good news because it means if you want a different way of being, it's habit. So you're just changing your habits, which means you know how habits are. They take a long time to develop, but then once they're there, they're spontaneous. So that's so far been bad news, but in the future can be good news, <laughs> you know? And so it's kind of keeping that lightness of, of course I'm like this given my life. Of course I'm like this given my context. Why would I be any other way? Like, you're not bad, you know? It's just natural that you would wind up with these behaviors, with these ways of speaking. Of course you would. And now you're just kind of taking a step back to ask, which ones are worth keeping and I want to take with me to my next life? Or if I don't believe in future lives, what's the legacy I want to leave to the relationships in my life after I pass? And we know that we don't want to leave a legacy of people feeling crap because we said mean things to them, <laughs> you know, for example, million examples, but you know, and so what you're just doing is just keeping that mindfulness of expect to fail. Of course, you're not going to change overnight, but how can you remember on purpose? And a lot of mindfulness trainings is kind of noticing natural gaps in the day where it's easier to come back to yourself and get kind of reflective and more introspective and plan for those to be just, even if it's a minute or two, these are my moments of coming back to my mindfulness and checking, am I staying in alignment with my new priorities or with my new core values? You know, it can be as simple as every time you put the kettle on for a cup of tea, while the kettle is waiting to boil, you're just coming back to, may I not harm? May I be of benefit? You know, and you're just kind of saying it in your head. No one has to know. 
You know, I, I try and kind of revive my motivation whenever I put my shoes on or take my shoes off because there's a lot of shoes on, shoes off in my line of work, you know, <laughs> shoes on, shoes off. So whenever I'm doing the shoes on, shoes off, I'm trying to remember that to make sure it's resynchronized. And honestly, it is just habit. So you do it more and more, comes easier and easier. And I think every time you notice yourself slipping into old habits, you just say, oh, of course. Yeah, of course. And back to it. If you over identify with the bad habit that you've noticed, then you have all this shame around it and you want to avoid seeing it or you see it too much and identify with it and it becomes a whole story, which is much harder to move on from. If you want to just say, oh yeah, that's not what I'm doing now. I'm trying not to talk like that now. Okay, back in the saddle. It's not a whole big story. You don't have to justify. There's nothing to excuse. It's just like, yep, of course I fell off the wagon. That's fine. Anyway, back to it. And really the, that anyway, back to it, gets shorter and shorter until you have a different default setting, you know? So, so really don't beat yourself up. And, you know, the age that you are is the age that you are, but it, from a Buddhist perspective, our consciousnesses are, have been around from beginningless time. We're all the same age. <laughs> We're all the same age. Some of us have been humans longer or more often than others. Some of us have been, you know, trundling around as, I don't know, golden retrievers, I feel in my case for quite a while. You know, we forget stuff, you know, we might have learned it once and it's way back eons ago and now we're re-remembering it, you know. It'll take the time it takes. Just be happy you found a container that gives you meaning and joy, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we'll have a um, five minute break, then we'll come back and do meditation. So I'll see you in a sec.
Okay, come on back when you're ready. Okay, so we'll we'll do some meditation and um, we're gonna do a meditation based on the Vajrasattva practice. And the Vajrasattva practice is the Buddha of purification. And I'm just gonna kind of throw you in the deep end and see how you go. For some of you, this is very familiar practice. For some of you, it's brand new. But the Vajrasattva practice is a way of kind of burning the negative karmic seeds so they can't give suffering. And it's very straightforward. And the main point is regret, not guilt. So re regret is seeing a fault to be a fault because it's not what you want to do. It's like, whoops, nope, not me, not what I'm doing. Guilt is, and therefore I'm bad, <laughs> or therefore I should be punished, or therefore I should have a sinking feeling about my horror as a human. Do not go into guilt. If you notice yourself going, oh God, I do that too, I'm so bad. No, 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 no. <laughs> Okay, so regret is seeing a fault to be a fault with just clean, clear eyes. And in so doing, it helps you not do it in the future. So it's really self-reflective. And, um, and then if you have questions, we can talk about it either after this session or next week. So nice straight back. <clears throat> and just breathe into this physical posture for a minute. Just kind of get yourself settled. Letting go of any physical tension that you might have carried or accumulated. and bring a sense of having a strong and stable back without it becoming tight or rigid, just very stable. Imagining all of your vertebrae stacking on top of one another evenly and balanced. Even if that isn't the case, just imagine that so. And a very soft, receptive front, not clenching or holding in any muscles. The belly completely relaxed. The lungs filling and emptying completely. Just see if you can soften the front and strengthen the back. And then think to yourself, I'm going to experiment with this meditation on Vajrasattva and the four opponent powers in order to purify my mind of suffering and its cause, of all the places harm comes from. And in so doing, may I come closer to my fullest potential in order to be of benefit to all sentient beings. And so we start with refuge. And you can visualize above the crown of your head is Vajrasapa. Or if it's a new idea, just radiant white light, very simple, above your head. 
and you think that this radiant white light, with or without Vajrasattva in the center, that this represents your potential, that this embodies all of your sources of protection. Compassion, wisdom, ability. And whether you can visualize or not, just have an awareness of the presence of refuge, support. And think, I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my merits of giving and other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. And you can just repeat that to yourself and let it resonate, let it connect. and really feel that compassionate wisdom is bearing witness that you're able to be completely honest about your mistakes and that you will still be completely accepted and loved and held. That the only reason for naming these mistakes is because you understand they are not you and can be moved through. If we identify them, we can catch them. If we regret them, we can purify them. So you just use those ideas to feel very safe to be honest. And so feeling the presence of refuge, then we generate the power of regret, recognizing a fault to be a fault. You can just think through the 10 non-virtues or any specific one you know is very habitual. And just ask yourself about your own habits. What are some things I need to regret? physically, verbally, mentally. And if you were to think about the physical or verbal mistakes you make a lot, what would you guess is the most common affliction underneath them? Is it more in the realm of attachment, craving, covetousness? 
Or is it more likely to be about ill will, hatred, anger, irritability? Or more likely to be related to wrong views or ignorance, dull, spacey, that genre? Just checking in with the mental habits underneath the mistakes. Which ones are most common? Maybe certain times of day, you're more likely to be angry. Other times of day, more likely to be attached. Maybe they all take turns. Maybe one is your go-to. Doesn't really matter. Just check as an exercise of self-awareness. And then we think, I don't have to carry these mistakes. There's a remedy, a countermeasure. And so we think from the beautiful, radiant white light above our head, from the Vajrasattva energy above us, streams of white light flow down through the crown of our head, down and through purifying your body, speech, and mind. And if it feels comfortable, you can add the mantra to the visualization. Om Vajrasattva Hum, 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 Om Vajrasattva Hum. and then generate the power of resolve, which is just a time-specific promise to yourself and the Guru Buddha Vajrasattva about what one will refrain from in the future, for how long specifically. So just think in terms of something physically, verbally, and mentally you're going to work on from now on but don't make it too hard or overwhelming. It might be just for the rest of the evening or for tomorrow. A way in which to change the pattern, but it's a short enough promise that you can really keep it. So just make a quiet little plan to yourself.
And when you have your plan, some small thing you can change physically, verbally, or mentally, even if only for the rest of the evening, repeat it to yourself so you don't forget. Picture yourself in the time to come and how you'll keep that promise. And then think that Vajrasattva above your crown or the simple white light dissolves into light and absorbs into you, blessing your body, speech, and mind. And think that just as I've made mistakes physically, verbally, and mentally, there are countless ways I've been of benefit physically, verbally, mentally. And so just let yourself rejoice for a moment. There is much good done by you. And there is much good done by the people in your life. And there is much good done by humanity various charities and social services, educators and meditators, doctors and scientists, and much good is done by all sentient beings in small or large ways, human and otherwise. And vast good is done by the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, by the gurus, showing us what is possible with this mind of ours. And then we dedicate, may the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow. May that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. May the precious view of emptiness that has not arisen arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. Um, your attention. Okay, thanks everyone. And um, if you're having questions that are coming up, go ahead and write them down so you don't lose them. And we can um, come back to them next week. And then Christina maybe has some announcements. Yeah, I um, just wanted to mention to everybody during the break, I put up a couple of upcoming events. Um, one obviously being Venerable Yunten's class this next week on the six perfections. The other being this Saturday with Geshe Dakpa, Calm Abiding. 
And also that same morning, right before the class, we're having a, a meditation with our uh, teacher, Venerable Amy, who's newly arrived. So it'd be awesome to show her some support. And one last thing, I just added it in the chat. There's so many wonderful things happening. I know you all appreciate um, the teachings of Venerable Yontan. So I wanted to let you know ahead of time in about two and a half weeks, um, October 16th and 17th, she'll be holding a white Tara retreat over the weekend. It's about a day and a half. And so I dropped the link to that as well, if you guys would like to uh, check that out. So thank you so much, Venerable Yonten. You're incredible. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. You guys have a good rest of your night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.